sale is important for us, but it's not a lifeblood for us because for us, majority of the orders get placed during the year. Okay. So this is different from some of the other e-commerce platforms where large percentage of the GMB comes mm-hmm. during festival sales. Uh-huh. And at a BAU level, we do more number of orders than Flipkart and Amazon individually. That was when we got introduced to social commerce. Ki people are now leveraging social media to do commerce and this seems to be a trend which is starting. Right. So we thought, okay, it seems like a good market. A huge opportunity of converting, of making this offline commerce go online and bringing in efficiencies. Right. One of the rituals that we have is listen or die. We call it LOD internally. So whenever a new person joins of me, he is given a list of users, IDs and supplier IDs. And this person would then go back and talk to them to understand their problems hey. and to relate to those problems. And Misho is a strongly data-driven company. Most of the distance are backed by data. There are hundreds of analysts, business folks just looking at data for making decisions. Uh, the plan is to have uh, invest more on the AI side, you said right. I think over the last one year we have increased data science team by about 4x at least. So a lot more investments going into real time personalization. It's fantastic time to be in tech specifically in India because I think this is a time when you see a lot of innovation happening. Yeah. And uh, you increasingly see the type of innovation which is happening. It's more solving India's specific problems. Hi, welcome to yet another episode of Scale Up Pod. And uh, Today we have with us uh, Sanjeev from uh, Misho. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev, for taking out your time. Happy to be here. Right. So uh, we will get started with uh, the first question, which uh, usually I ask to all my guests. And it's nice way to start a conversation. And I get a lot of different answers because lots of people in different stages of companies and all. So what does a day in the life of a CTO of Misho look like? <laughs> And so imagine that that day is very different for every CTO. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So that's why I want your answer. I think. Uh, yeah, I try to get up before 7 in the morning. Three days a week, I have reserved for exercise, yeah, standard basic weightlifting, endurance, what. The remaining three days or two days is for generally for reading something. It's either books, blogs. And then I think mostly my day starts at 9.30 or 10. And I'm a lazy person. <laughs> One, my day... And I had to be forced to start my day at 9.30 or 10 and hence I start the day with a meeting. So there's one meeting scheduled every day at 10 a.m. At least, if not 9.30. That makes you start that, yes. Forces me to uh, show up in office and start the day. After that, it's it's it. So I think showing up is the biggest yeah. step. After that, everything is easy, right? So yeah, I think it's mostly about... Um, and because we're in a hyperscaling phase, there'll be a lot of fires to be handled... But uh, yeah, after that structured meeting, it's about either handling fires or getting involved in tools or the long-term projects, long-term discussions, brainstorming sessions. And uh, yeah, I think uh, once every week, uh, I try to kind of stay connected with my direct reports. I to understand what is going on in different areas. And uh, about one day, which is roughly... Six to eight hours is reserved for my personal thinking time every week. Okay. Because that is important. Like every week, I would want to kind of take a step back and try to focus on a lot more long-term stuff, which is maybe three to six months to one year out. What else needs to be done? The thinking time helps in you know, going deeper and uh, trying to figure out what else is missing in the entire puzzle. So I think, yeah, broadly, this is how it looks like. So, uh, like, Probably a follow up on that is uh, like at a size and scale where uh, Misho is now, you have to probably spend a fair bit of time talking to people in tech as well, which is your team, and then talking to the other stakeholder yeah. business and all. So, how does that get balanced? Like, how much time does get shared between? Yeah, I think roughly I would say 50% goes into tech, like engineering specifically. At every point in time, we have, let's say, a big complex engineering project running in parallel across the country. For example, right now we have, let's say, um, Kubernetes migration running. Okay. Later this year we'll have GCP migration running. So these are some of the engineering specific, you know, projects running for longer periods where I would want to get involved. So that takes up about 50%. There'll be additional stuff like, let's say, preparing for sale. So like three months before sale, you'd start thinking about how do you support, let's say, 2x, 3x of the current scale. Yeah. But yeah, so 50% is the engineering part. Right? I think 30% would go into product and business. Right. 
and uh, probably 20%, depending on what time of the year it is, it is either uh, split. I would say I think remaining 50%, which is split between product, people management, and hiring. Right. And hiring would include branding, etc. But remaining 50% is split between three buckets. The distribution varies throughout the year depending on the type of problems and the pace of hiring. Right. Very complex. Right. Yeah. So uh, another question that I uh, do ask, uh, you know, when when uh, people are starting to lead teams and the teams grow big, and I like this question because I want an answer from you as well around this is that uh, now with a fairly big team and all, uh, how much uh, time uh, do you get, or also how often do you get to like get into the weeds, get into the you know code actually sometimes and uh, talk to your SD ones, SD twos, and then work with the projects that they are working on. So, how often does that happen? A and B, like, do you miss it? <laughs> yeah, I think definitely I miss it. When you start, uh, when we started, right, I was the only coder, and yeah, I'd built backend, Android, frontend, everything. So, definitely I miss that. But uh, now I kind of try to restrict my involvement. So, I think I'd take this in two parts, right? One is getting involved in the tech side of things, second is staying connected with people on the ground. And both are important, and both can be done kind of independently. So getting involved on the tech side, I do get involved, but most of the time it kind of stays restricted until architecture level, yeah. which is for most of the important architecture discussions, which is decisions which is happening in the company. Um, there I try to get involved. And obviously not each and every architecture decision, it's, uh, it's not possible to get involved in each and every important architecture discussion, but I do kind of prioritize and selectively try to kind of uh, be part of those brainstorming sessions. That helps in understanding how is architecture evolving and what else needs to be done mm. to support, let's say, not two days, but whatever, three years, four years down the line, sort of scale. Beyond that, on the people side, we stay connected with almost everyone. At every level, everyone is again not possible. We have roughly about 600 member odd engineering team. The way I do it is we have, let's say, for each level, and we have multiple pods, multiple logs, some combination of level cross pod sort of groups we create, and then we kind of get into group discussion and just trying to understand what is happening on the ground, what is not working well, what is working well, what needs to change. And this happens at every level, right, from AC1 to obviously tracker level. So, and third is obviously coding is important, and you want to be very close to ground. Grab realize it, it's generally hard to kind of contribute to production code frequently. <laughs> but, and obviously you have a lot of craving for doing that. <laughs> and that I try to handle through my hobby projects, which is maybe I'll pick up something over the weekend and try to do it and then will extend for months. But that is where I try to you know, balance it out. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, so we'll uh, come back and delve a little bit more into uh, Misho's challenges and uh, team and all. Um, uh, but, but I'd like to first know a little bit about uh, your journey so far as well. Uh, so like, how how did you like get into the world of tech and from there till, till coming to Misho, how has the journey been like? What all your experiences? Yeah, I was, I was born and brought up in a small town in Jharkhand called Hazariba. Most people would not have heard of it. But uh, yeah, I think, and the choice was pretty simple then. Uh, this was early 2000s, either become an engineer or a doctor. Okay. <laughs> These are the two options in small town, right? Like, yeah. Those are broadly two preferred options that you think of. There are some people who would pursue very interesting domains. Yeah. But uh, I did not. And uh, I think, uh, obviously, your family shapes a lot of these behaviors. People around you uh, shape a lot of these behaviors. And in the part of the country where I come from, I think job security used to be one of the most important problems that needs to be still is for a lot of It is for most. Yeah. Yeah. And become a doctor of engineer. Is a, yeah. and, and the sin was simple. I didn't like, uh, I didn't have good memory. And even now, I don't have great memory. <laughs> but... Uh, so I didn't go with biology, I go. With, I went with maths and hence I became an engineer. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's not very clear what am I going to build as an engineer. I like building stuff. Yeah. But uh, for coming into engineering, and I'm an electrical engineer, I'm not a computer science engineer. But uh, after getting into college, I just realized that 
and first year i think first year i spent uh, trying to figure out what else do i need to do in my life and it's a very difficult problem to you know get an answer to second year i started getting involved in robotics in my college uh, built some robots won some competitions and uh, as part of robotics you would obviously build robots but you would also you know, do some bits of programming to navigate that robot in a different basic complexities i think at that point in time it didn't seem very basic but yeah it was pretty basic complexities of navigating robots but uh, that is when i you know first and you have certain programming courses etc in college yeah. but uh, that real life experience of building something seeing something move according to the way you command it in that created a difference that was what helped help me get interested in let's say programming is an interesting domain let's explore it further and then i in my third year i did my internship again that was around uh, building something on android ecosystem uh, and uh, that was full fledged programming and that is where i really got interested in okay this seems like something and then i did my btech projects etc in again image processing and so on nice so i think it did touch a lot of domains and then realized that okay um programming is something that i would definitely want to pursue in my career and um, yeah by the time i had figured it out it was placement season there <laughs> this i and placement is a very difficult time generally like right? you know, a lot of pressure like in certain companies coming in there certain priority of companies uh, from it daily so and most ids have this concept of day one day two, day one day. not another yeah. So yeah, yeah, immense pressure of okay, and yeah. will I be able to crack D one or, or or will it go to D two? And companies are still okay, like D two, D two, D three also companies are great. But it's like A one and it goes until exactly. two A M and so yeah, that number. <laughs> <laughs> and you're trained to always you know, excel at it. So yeah, I managed to get into Sony in Japan. So Sony headquarters is in Tokyo, and they kind of come to India for selective roles, and uh, they haven't got a D one slot in. I managed to get there, so yeah, that is how all of this started. And uh, so I was working with Sony in Tokyo for three years. Uh, first one and a half years was in uh, the consumer camera division, which was DSLR and cyber shots. Nice. So they're uh, is building their application layer. They have their own operating system, real time operating system, mm-hmm. on top of which they have a bunch of features. So first one and a half years was that. Second one and a half year, so I spent three years in Japan, and second one and a half year was with Sony Mobile again in Tokyo. So there they are trying to port kind of. So Sony has this amazing camera technology. Yeah. Obviously they will pick up that. Oh great! I still have one of the Xperia phones. I get from outside India. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You can't even buy in India anymore, but yeah, correct. And even today, probably the image sensors that Apple uses is of Sony. Yeah, the IMX. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was on the software side, but yeah, even on the software side, they have a lot of amazing stuff. At that point in time, Sony Mobile used to be one of the top three cameras yeah. in globally. Like they have this cameras for thing. So yeah, for the next one and a half years, I was working with their Sony Mobile camera division, which was more like going into your Android open source code base. And then, uh, so basically, there's this application layer which most most people are familiar with, where yeah. you kind of. Build your applications and whatever Java, Kotlin, and so on. Then, as you go deeper, you have Android services layer. Then, as you go deeper, you have this hardware abstraction layer, yeah. which kind of then interfaces with your hardware and driver layer. So, as operating in this hardware abstraction layer and the driver layer, and it was interesting. I think uh, did a lot of problem solving there. Um, this was just one fifteen. Then yeah, then we jumped back, came came back came back to India and jumped into startup. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great story and a lot of it uh, coincidentally a bit relatable because uh, I also did my engineering in electrical only. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, same. I think uh, got got you missed that decision of not choosing computer science then. I I would say not. I mean I think uh, because uh, when I. A little later, probably third year, fourth year of engineering and all, when I, and I was was like the same like robots and all, Arduino, all of that things, right? Uh, then I start seeing that sometimes people who have not had mm. the uh, taste of like actually working with electronics, yeah. um, sometimes it gives you a disadvantage. Uh, and the advantage that I felt myself was that 
you really understand the bare metal cost of what you're doing yeah. a lot of times. Uh, right. I mean, not just about, okay, you're managing memory and all. Sometimes like, okay, I know the cost of the multiplier operation is costlier than a plus operation. Yeah. Because you've gone down and written the microcontroller yeah. code. Right. So that I, I have felt like sometimes it's like a advantage also in a way because you know that down there what happens. Yeah. And I think what may also used to think make me curious a lot was like uh, school level education, I feel like little and all. You get to understand that, okay, what Boolean logic is, zero ones that you understand. Yeah. You also understand that, okay, how a, let's say, PN junction works. But what happens between? Yeah. So, because, okay, electrical, electronics, transistor, we understand from here. Boolean has been somewhere a layer, two, three layers above. But what is happening in between these two, three layers? And that's something you get to learn if you are in electronics or in electrical. Yeah. So, I think, uh, I do cherish that, I would say. I don't, uh, uh, I have no regrets that I did not take computer science yeah. in that time. Yes. And uh, about the Sony part, like I was saying, like, apart from being a very big uh, fan, I used to work on uh, this um, uh, Sony's mobile division, Xperia, uh, mm -hmm. the one which was based out of Sweden. Uh, yeah, in Malmoe. So, they had this free Xperia project where they would support a lot of open source developers. Uh, so, I was part of that project. So, uh, probably might have written some shims on top of the drivers here. Yeah. <laughs> no, in Sweden, so you're right, and Sony Mobile you kind know, of had their headquarters in Sweden and gradually it started shifting to Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most of the open source contribution of Sony back to Android ecosystem happened out of Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so those people, uh, this Alan Jarpelia and he's running this uh, team there. So, um, and I got to work on that and I think uh, uh, that I look back with, with a bit of wonder at my own skills back then because I, I did not know a lot of things about like uh, fundamental stuff. Like I think I have written a bunch of C code uh, without really having any formal knowledge of how C works. Like okay, I need, need a bit of Java code and all, but then yeah. I have to probably uh, you know reverse engineer a driver, seeing a header files and trying to understand something and probably not even understanding a bunch of those compiler directives and all. Uh, but but managed to let's say like uh, because. The, you guys would not out open source the core camera driver because obviously we don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I could relate. I, I could see that happening. I think in Tokyo, even then, I think the philosophy was gradually starting to change. But yeah. the default, de facto kind of mode was we'll build something, but we'll not contribute back to open source because there's something which is very critical IP that company should yeah. and so what. We saw that changing gradually, but it was far from where. Yeah, it should be. So, so Sony used to contribute the uh, the kernel itself because that's GPU. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the camera drivers and all the headers they would publish, but not the actual driver. Yeah. So from the headers, we would because we would try to port the latest version of Android, which is not released on that phone. Right. So, but it was fun. I think uh, you know, like trying to sort of hack around the code without really understanding that. Uh, now after learning a lot more, I think going back, I would wonder that how was I able to write those shims and all because I did not understand what's happening yeah. inside. Well, that's the beauty of code, right? You can just look at it. It's basic logic. So you can always look at it and do something and then see what the what is the impact of that change on wherever you're trying to test. Yeah. And hopefully revert it and do something else. Yeah. And I think that that, that way, I think uh, with, with uh, electronics versus uh, mm. like uh, pure software, one well, thing is like the cost is very high. Electronics are doing a mistake. Like bunch of times it happened like, you know, connected a wire in the wrong socket and a 3000 Raspberry Pi goes up in flames. Uh, uh, that is, that did not happen here. You know, play button, pause button. <laughs> Lives are easier. But software engineers, it's very easy. I, I, I could see and as again, I think Sony times and they're trying to upgrade their entire chip, mm -hmm. which is the chip that powers your most of the cameras. They're trying to redesign that chip. Yeah. And to the, to the point of the cost of making a mistake being pretty high. They kind of designed that chip and obviously there are simulators to verify that design, but they're only accurate to a certain extent. It went into manufacturing and this is not my team, this is different division, which was hardware. Okay, I had a friend again from ID Bombay who was working in this project and it went into manufacturing and this manufacturing used to happen out of Taiwan. Taiwan or yeah, in some way in shape. Yeah, so they kind of got the first batch and that had some bug in it. Oh. And they lost like millions of dollars just because of that bug. That is a cost of yeah. Making a mistake in your chip production, yeah, and that too it was caught very early. Yeah, imagine if that had gone into you know if that got gone into the market, it was, if it was released, the cost would have been much much higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in software, I think uh, the way we operate, the cost is pretty minimal. Yeah, which kind of helps in making those mistakes, learning from them quickly, and moving fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I think that electronics world definitely, I mean, fascinating. I, I still remember uh, I was um, interning at this uh, company, Micromac. They used to make a lot of movies yeah, so. uh, back then in India. And uh, Qualcomm had uh, taken us on a tour to the Hyderabad office, talking about their designing chips and all. And uh, I was interning then. I was first year in college, just, uh, but I just happened to be interning at Micromac. So they took me that same time. Yeah. And uh, that's the first time I um, was, uh, I got to know about binning basically, right? So they're like, okay, we make a quad core processor yeah. and one of the cores does not work. Then we sell it as a dual core. And I was like, oh, yeah. like the, the cost of mistakes are, that's all you manage it. your mistakes. Yeah, you manage a mistake like this. Is, uh, Very interesting. You produce everything as quad core. Some are sold as single core, some as dual core because stuff. Oh, then you know this, then it's not an intentional dual core thing. Yeah, so, so Used. if the, some of the cores are not working, they just, Re rebin oh. that as dual core. I'm like, okay, that's how you manage your mistakes. The, the cost is that high. Right? Okay. And then the actual cost of manufacturing is same for all the chips because you start manufacturing the same way. First. Yeah. Is that you are able to, sell, you can't sell them as quad core because all the chips. So I've seen this in software industry as well, like even in Sony cameras. So the cost of software is negligible, right? In the sense that uh, you, if you've developed a particular technology yeah. for camera, the cost of deploying that technology on a low-end smartphone of Xperia and high-end smartphone Xperia is pretty yeah, marginal cost. Yeah, very much. Yeah. But they'll selectively choose to not deploy it even though hardware supports it because that is to create a differentiation for the customer. Yeah, the the, okay, and the market theory. Exactly. That is what you yeah. kind of get customers to pay for. But the incremental cost of deploying that yeah. is very minimal. It's almost close to zero. Right. If they would selectively go and turn off certain feature flags in your low-end smartphones so that you don't go get those features. So, the interesting way of running business. Right. Uh, but Sony, I think, Sony, like, some legendary stories out of Sony as well because I remember, like, when that Fukushima thing happened. Yeah. I think for two years, phones did not have cameras above 8 megapixels because that was, I think, uh, they had, like, uh, reduced production or something like that. I think oh, yeah. that's, that's really, like, a... I would say it's a very different level to be where like if you are not able to produce camera like across the world no phones have good camera. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's because they are, they, they, they kind of own the entire image uh, yeah. sensor manufacturing. Mostly companies use yeah. their image sensors. Right, right. So so then like after Sony uh, like came back and then uh, how was the journey I would like to know like from, from like how things got built from day one and how did like I think you are saying that you were the one who was writing the code, like, day yeah. one. So, how did it go from, like, one person to hundreds of people? Uh, it's an interesting story. So, yeah, I think in the beginning, it was me and with it, uh, um, I was a tech founder, he was a non-tech founder, so all things tech, kind of, I was handling all things not tech he was handling, but it didn't kind of work that way. Even some bits of non-tech I had to handle, for example, doing deliveries <laughs> as well. <laughs> I wouldn't call it tech. That's an interesting story. I think we we kind of started something in 2015, mid 2015. So I think the fundamental fundamental hypothesis always was that India is a primarily kind of uh, offline commerce driven economy, right? Uh, most of the commerce happens offline. Even today, more than 85 to 90 percent happens offline. And uh, the the incumbent e-commerce platforms then, which is Amazon, Flipkart, were mostly targeted towards brands and mid to high income segment people. But that is not real India. Real India, you know kind of food brands, which is mostly your um, people from low to mid income segment here to and beyond. So we thought, okay, it seems like a good market, a huge opportunity of converting, of making this offline commerce go online and bringing in efficiencies right. through that. And the first model I have tried was, I think, uh, what we call fashion year, which is fashion nearby, which is essentially trying to, when we started from Kormangla, NHSR. So it was more like uh, people had options of ordering, options of looking at for fashion shops around their locality. And right. then trying to buy something by sitting at home. Think of it as swiggy for fashion. Got it. So you order food from restaurant. This was more ordering fashion from restaurant. Right. Look, fashion from fashion outlet. Fashion outlet. The way it started was, yeah, we both took a small 2 VHK in Kurmangla. <laughs> and the uh, Dining table used to be our office, and uh, yeah, I built an app. And uh, what we would do was during daytime, me and with it will go to, let's say, some of the fashion shops out there. And I had a Sony camera which I had brought from Japan. So, 
you just click product pictures, come back, do some photoshopping, edit it, and then upload it on an app. We'll get some orders, maybe one to ten orders per day. And we'll split the deliveries. At times with it, we'll do the delivery. At times, I'll do, I'll do the delivery, which is picking up from a warehouse or from one of these shops and delivering to customer. And uh, yeah, and this was during the rainy season, which is mid of middle of the year, which is we started in, we launched in August. And this is the peak rainy season in Bangalore. So at times you would get wet while delivering. <laughs> And we had kept a delivery boy, but that guy wouldn't show up most of the time. Because you can't, because it's your own money, you can't spend. Yeah, and hiring great areas. You can't have multiple because you're trying to optimize on the cost. Mm-hmm. But that is how one of this started, right? And we and had for a couple of months realized uh, there are multiple problems uh, with this hyper local fashion model. The biggest one is you just cannot offer the amount of selection which is required. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're very limited in terms of the variety that you can offer. And uh, the good thing was we are working with a lot of smaller uh, shops there, right? And there's a particular behavior that these shops kind of showed us because we would spend a lot of time in these shops clicking product pictures trying to understand what is happening. They would kind of, whenever some whenever a customer used to walk in into their shop, they would note down their phone number and add them to a WhatsApp group. Oh. And then whenever uh, they got a new assortment, which is new products, they take product pictures and send it to that WhatsApp group. Okay, we have this new thing. If you're interested, just come and buy it. Right. So that was when we got introduced to social commerce. Ki people are now leveraging social media to do commerce and this seems to be a trend which is starting. Right. Yeah, I think uh, um, we realized that uh, social commerce is kind of interesting phenomena which seems to be picking up. And then we discovered a lot of Facebook shopping groups which are dedicated to buying and selling. There are lakhs of users added where people would just do commerce. And uh, yeah, I think that is how Misho's first version started which was more like Shopify, uh, Indian version of Shopify for um, for individual shopkeepers which is more like enabling people who are trying to sell online. Right. By providing them storefront, which is they can list their product pictures, have payment gateway options integrated, have basic order management and so on. Right. And most of the people who started using this were housewives, were running their own online boutiques mm. right. through WhatsApp. So they would come to me show, create their own shop, start sharing those links in Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups and so on. Right. And then they would do it their own fulfillment. So that is how Misho's first version got started. Right. And since then, obviously, a lot of things have changed. But, uh, yeah, until then, I, it was just me and with it. So I would build, yeah, that code during daytime, during nighttime, whenever I would get time after deliveries and after photo editing. So I have, I have uh, two questions, uh, probably on the earlier side of the journey uh, here. Um, one is that, uh, you know, like integrating with, say, platforms like WhatsApp and, uh, you know, WhatsApp groups and uh, Facebook groups and all which, like, I guess, back in the day, not all have very nice-looking APIs and all of yeah. that stuff, right? So, uh, I think one is, like, uh, how, how uh, what were the tech challenges, uh, like, to, to to sort of integrate with sort of non-conventional uh, mechanisms of, I think, information sharing and all um, of these? I think, at that point in time, the challenge was... Not about how do we integrate with Facebook. I think Graph APIs had kind of showed up then. Hmm. So Facebook had started implementing Graph APIs around 13, 14. Yeah. Um, so until so in 2015, we had fairly decent uh, Graph APIs available for kind of sharing new posts to groups, to, to your own wall. And uh, even sharing to WhatsApp was there. There are certain limitations on, let's say, how do you share multiple pictures with different text content against each picture. Yeah, I think that was a big limitation that uh, WhatsApp sharing had then, it has even now. Hmm. I do remember vaguely that uh, we did build something for, and because our TG was mostly resellers, mostly houses would do this throughout the day, which is they would be in touch with their own WhatsApp groups. The kind of conversation that you'll have in those WhatsApp groups is some customer asking, can you show me a red kurti? And then the flow would look like she'll go come back to her shop and share a product 
picture and URL of that red kurti to simplify this entire UX. They had built something which we called Misho Bubble. It's essentially your messenger sort of bubble which is draggable. So whenever WhatsApp kind of showed up in the foreground in Android, we would kind of draw that bubbles. And when you tap that, you'll see your own product pictures so that you can very quickly select and share it without switching apps. Exactly. So that is one kind of optimization that we brought in. Right, right. But uh, beyond this, I think uh, there's been fairly kind of okay sort of integrations with both the black moves. Right. The next question is uh, probably not just at like day zero stage, but also uh, as you're probably early stage of the team grew, like, you know, sitting in Kolmangla and HSR and, you know, uh, like obviously extremely urban techie crowd who will be building this app. And your users being like, you know, going into smaller towns, housewives, running boutiques and all. Um, so what's the, I would say, journey of a uh, engineer at Misho to develop that user empathy? Because I think the chasm is very wide there, right? Between the user and who is making yeah. this product. You're right. I think it's very difficult. And that is where one of the rituals that we have is listen or die. We call it LOD internally. Basically, Irrespective of whichever function or a designation, whichever function you're part of or whichever designation you have, you need to do user calls. So whenever a new person joins of me, kind of, he is given a list of users, IDs and a supplier IDs. And this person would then go back and talk to them to understand their problems right, and to relate to those problems. Mm-hmm. And then come back and kind of present insights from that and so that flows into the product development. But uh, that is one big step which helps in bridging that gap. Otherwise, you are right. You can enter into this situation where so in simpler problems like most of the techies that you have, that we have and most people in Bangalore will have smartphones beyond certain level. Right? They'll have certain yeah. processing power. They'll have certain memory. Performance will be great. Always on 4G. Always on 4G. So whenever you test your Android code on such a smartphone, you'll never encounter problems. Mm-hmm. And you go to low-end smartphone, that is when you kind of uncover and discover a lot of problems. So being able to relate to that is extremely important. That is where initially, I you know, we struggled with this. Initially, we struggled with this, in fact, to the extent that there's a time when we are talking about this WhatsApp sharing flow. So we implemented this where you can kind of select, uh, let's say, 10 images. Those 10 images, images get downloaded in background. But you click and then uh, share intent kind of opens a WhatsApp and you can select the conversation. Fairly simple flow. Takes about a few seconds to do that on 4G. Hmm. The catch is 4G because when you move to 3G or when you move to a 4G which is not stable, it just did not work. And when we launched this flow, and this is back in 2017, when we launched this flow, somehow people said it just doesn't work and we didn't realize what is happening. And... Uh, when we talk to them, we realize ki, sir, uh, it just keeps showing loading. Loader chalta it doesn't work. Uh-huh. And that is when we realize we're just doing it wrong. Like we're testing it wrong. We need to throttle the manual and test it. We can't test it on our good phones. Yeah. It has to be low end phone. But yeah, since then we have kind of evolved our rituals. But listen or die kind of has sticked with us. Right. And right. people not just do it after joining, but also some frequency, everyone is kind of enabled to do that. Makes sense, makes sense. So, uh, the, uh, I mean, from from then where it was largely like, you know, people sharing on WhatsApp and all, I think Misho now is like a much larger proper e platform kind of a thing. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say like tech-wise, it's a whole different scale, but how have the challenges changed? Like, I think, how to share photos on WhatsApp is not your <laughs> day and night challenge now, right? Something else, right? So, what are the tech challenges today? I think it's been a journey, right? And uh, most of the challenges that we had over the last five years are more scaling related, which is, and those are the interesting ones. For example, in 2021, this entire one year of 2021, we grew by 5x mm. in terms of number of orders, traffic, and everything. Um, and a uh, couple of years before that and that was when so basically and I'll, I'll maybe take a step back and I'll 
roll it back to when the marketplace started. So that is so currently, if you see, Misho is a marketplace between suppliers and end customers. Yeah, on the other side. The fundamental version of this marketplace, MVP, was built in 2017. Now, we think of it, the tech stack that we had was very non-traditional. I'd say, oh, very traditional, I would say, which is, we chose PHP as our tech stack, which is not the choice <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> Even then, it was not. The only reason we had PHP was because I was comfortable in that. Right. And I didn't want to spend a couple of months uh, just trying to learn and something. You basic Java, but just that I haven't, did not do web development in Java. Right. Maybe it would have taken a month. But I think at that stage, iterating fast, being able to test out your ideas very quickly is the most important thing. Everything else doesn't matter. So, yeah, we built it in PHP and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a language that works, but beyond certain scale, both in terms of number of people and on the user side, you'll start seeing problems. It's not a very organized language, I would say. So, and we obviously realized that fairly early and we started moving to microservices. Uh, and, and we started with Monolith and then moving to microservices and all the newer services were built in Java. So, now we are primarily a Java shop and uh, Spring Boot, Redis, yeah. SQL, HBase on the side, parts of the tech side. So, first biggest downtime was a big learning for us. And this is early 2019. And at this point in time, we had a Monolith which was a PHP model. Maybe it had 60% of the code base was in PHP, 40% a bunch of services in Java. Elasticsearch, we had just introduced, uh, which was for powering search. Our feeds used to run directly from database. We did not have a caching layer in between. Okay. Now, you might question why don't you have a caching layer, but again, the simple is the best. <laughs> the simplicity is the best way to kind of operate and uh, just need, didn't need data, didn't need cache at that point in time, and hence you don't need uh, uh, to introduce another component which increases the complexity, management overhead, and so on. So yes, your feed's getting served through database, and uh, yeah, we had sales starting at ATM. Suddenly, kind of traffic started showing up, and the systems went down because database choked. And uh, until then, we had put, so a lot more focus was on they're moving fast because that is extremely important. And you want to kind of iterate very quickly, solve a lot of problems. While doing that, you incur a lot of tech debt. Yeah. Which is PHP is a tech debt, Monolith is a tech debt, a bunch of other things. So that was a big turning point. It was from that day onwards, and I'll talk about how did we handle on that day, but that day onwards, we have structurally invested certain percentage of bandwidth of entire engineering team in clearing tech debt. Now that tech debt could vary over the period, but that per bandwidth kind of stays. And the inflection point in companies where platform teams get created and all of that. Yes, <laughs> and we did not create platform teams then, but we did kind of carve out certain percentage from each of the pots and said, see, your job from today is to make sure we support the scale for not today, but two years, three years down the line. Right. So that became the foundation, I think. But yeah, on that day, fortunately, and it was a bad down day. I think we were down for, so eight o'clock it went down, Somebody try and restart works. Restart <laughs> we restarted. Um, again, it went now. Um, and yeah, I think it was a couple of hours on that day. It's pretty bad. And then suddenly, someone kind of, because we had Elasticsearch running and uh, we had all the products kind of indexed in Elasticsearch, and someone was thinking, even before this, of shifting all the feed and a source to Elasticsearch. For non-search use cases as well. Okay. So fortunately, that was under development. Obviously not tested itself. So in that one hour, someone kind of, a few people kind of got together, did a lot of testing, bunch of ninja stuff. And then we kind of got the stuff, got the got the app back online. Feed source got changed from database to, from MySQL database to Elasticsearch. But that was a big eye open. I think since then, we have considered and invested the, uh, uh, good amount of bandwidth that varies from uh, 15 to 30 percent depending on the criticality of the tech tech across different teams. Yeah. But uh, that has helped. But yeah, I think that was the foundation after that. Uh, the kind of challenges that we have kind of incurred was uh, um, uh, back on the scaling side, which is uh, 
let's say uh, on the elastic search side it has been uh, a bit of learning curve for us yeah uh, i think um, in the in the beginning we didn't have circuit breaker patterns etc and obviously as you grow your architecture becomes very complex yeah. you have hundreds of services running now we have a bunch of stateless aggregators powering each real state in the app we stand top for your stateful layers and then there is a circuit breaker in between to make sure we at least partially kind of show information if something goes down yeah can focus on recovering quickly and so on but yeah challenges continue i think um, even in the recent sale that we had there sort of a bunch of interesting stories but uh, the last sale that we had uh, currently we operated about uh, four 15 420 lakh requests per second 4.4.2 4.2 lakh requests yeah 4.2 lakh requests per second overall yeah and back in and um, yeah a lot of interesting stories there uh, to to ring one of the to ring day two of sale or rather day one of sale that we had um during uh, just right before diwali there was a hot spot in one of the latest shards and uh, you know to debug that it's very difficult because it's a production system how do you quickly take an action you could see that cpu kind of increasing yeah so how do you know what is happening and then someone came back with a suggestion ki we will run monitor command and don't you run monitor command on redis but what happens is when you run that command the entire redis freezes for yeah. one second but that is the only way to kind of understand what is happening get that snapshot quickly yeah Mostly other ways you kind of spin up a new cluster, do all of that, but we don't know the problem yet. And you could see the CPU increasing, you could see traffic coming up. Our peak is afternoon one PM, and this was roughly about eleven o'clock in the morning. So you know that it's not going to survive the <laughs> the peak. So you have to do something. There's no other way. So someone ran monitor command, couple of seconds, very limited failure. But we realized, okay, this is a product which is creating problems. And but these kind of situations happen in war rooms nowadays, uh, which is Maybe more interesting and uh, looking back, it's more funny. But during that period, you see that you have that adrenaline rush. Yes, which kind of makes it worth it. Right, right, right. I think I take uh, two very I think uh, important takeaways from this. I think uh, one is obviously like once you reach uh, this particular uh, scale and there is an inflection point, and you have to start clearing your tech debt, and you have to start I'd say. your sales are like wars right and you have to prepare for wars so you have to have the yeah. correct equipment to go to war with yeah. uh, but the other takeaway also i feel is uh, and i am say correct me if i'm wrong but so you are 3 4 years into uh, uh, me show and you're still like for example product feed is coming from mysql db still which is also in a way like a good learning that you know till the point where a, a simple stack can survive you should keep on doing that and not, yeah. not you know spend time on over engineering something and and i have seen a lot of times you know uh, uh, very uh, young founders starting their first startup in a few months into it and you know without any users and they thinking of, okay we will do kubernetes and a cache and no automation <laughs> i think simple is the best we have realized so you don't have so many people to kind of handle these complexities right during this i did see see we had maybe 10 engineers right after cdc before series d we had maybe 30 40 engineers that's it right right this stage and we in fact did not have a infrastructure guy until cdc which is until 10 15 15 odd engineers we did not have infrastructure i was a, i was an infrastructure guy i was a remote guy who would kind of manage all the infrastructure now you just cannot manage kubernetes without having dedicated people looking at it is just not possible yeah We are now like reading to Google. It is. We could have done that a couple of years earlier. Maybe we should have, but it did not matter. I think as long as you keep the stack simple, even on the architecture side, I mean, we have a layered architecture, right. which is as far as possible. We try to, and the way layered architecture works is, let's say you have different layers, services across different layers in the architecture, and all the calls that we have across different services are either to the downward. Do the downstream into into a lower layer, yeah. or within the same layer, but never in the in the upper, upper layer, yeah. which simplifies your scale management. Because now you know that the scale on the third layer is very dependent on how many services are calling this third layer. Yeah. 
there's no cross connection going on here there's no layer 1 getting called by layer 2 again yeah getting calling back layer 1 so this simplicity kind of helps in traffic management and handling these sales scaling for these sales fairly more predictable there are an example the natural tendency and we operate at this scale right? we have this happen we currently have about 140 million or annual transacting users overall uh, monthly active users will be also we see number 120 and 30 million monthly active people who open the app at least once and during sale time obviously the increase in traffic is more 50% maybe some type code so the saying is at this scale when you operate the natural tendency is to before mega sale do a lot of puff testing right right and puff testing is costly one in terms of um uh, server cost because if you want to really do puff testing at our scale it's very costly our, our cloud bill runs in millions of dollars then you have to test out for a traffic which is a factor of this yeah and uh, millions of dollars are saying in in uh, per month but even if you want to test it for a day it's a subsequent it's a substantial cost there's also people cost to it when you do puff large part of the bandwidth goes into that somebody who's sitting and doing that correct then it's hundreds of micro services how do you do that puff so we have tried to consciously stay away from doing puff and this is very counterintuitive because you have to do puff to lift through sale so here we rely a lot more on distributed ownership which is so we have bunch of pods in me show each pod owns a bunch of services each service is a has a owner we rely a lot more on that person's judgment to understand what is the bottleneck in scaling this service for this season's sale or for the next sale okay and this person is confident that i'll be able to handle this scale we don't recommend for and which is where we believe in people more than technology which is we rely on people's judgment to and you know, say that okay i just don't need to do a buff and there be certain sp- and when you apply this judgment you'll have let's say 10% of the services where people are not confident and feel that something will break and what will break is not known yet and hence i'll do a buff to uncover that right. that reduces our cost both on infrastructure and people drastically from like 100% to 10% right so that helps a lot interesting interesting i think uh, as going to uh, actually uh, ask a little bit about this which have answered some of it like what uh, you know like asking people uh, like with your teams project be able to handle the scale and all uh, what I was going to ask is uh, like uh, e-com products obviously that seasonality around sales is like that the lightning rod right <laughs> so so i think uh, for for the tech team uh, right and i'm i would say asking both from a team philosophy perspective as well and how the tech actually uh, stands up to the challenge like when in the days you're going up to the sale right so are there any special rituals are there any particular processes that you follow uh, are there any very strong learnings from there like you know when you're going into one of your blockbuster sales and all of that so how is that time like before the sale sure so I'll just uh, want to address that one point which is sale is important for us but it's not a life threat for us because for us majority of the you know orders get placed during the okay so this is different from some of the other e-commerce platforms where large percentage of the gmv comes mm-hmm. during festival sales uh uh-huh. for us sale helps in retention which is bringing users back and building that habit but large part of the gmv is spread throughout the year okay okay but having said that sale is important because you do see drop in traffic 2% 10% 100% so in this ritual has also evolved earlier in this very interesting story like 2019 january and this before that mega downtime that i was discussing we ran our first or second sale at that point time we used to do i don't know maybe 80000 90000 1 lakh orders per day or yeah something around that and we we basically did double which is the orders doubled on that sale day. for the first sale we didn't do anything which is very counterintuitive place like, you know you are running sale you would go check your databases yes, scale work in yoga do you want to double that database do you want to go to next year people didn't do anything i <laughs> said looking back that is not the best decision <laughs> but we did not 
we because nobody knew what is the scale that you will expect on the same day that was the first sale yeah some is eat 10% some is saying 20% we went to 100% for the order data basis at least theek hai it worked after that obviously once it works we are very high confident then apne to banaya sin pe khel it will work so people have very high confidence ki now to we don't need to do anything for sale and the mega downer that happened was second sale okay <laughs> people said we don't zone need to do anything like they said that we have built works <laughs> right but that led to the downturn but after that i think we have started taking sale uh, very seriously uh, now we have this concept of we run one sale every month and then the biggest sale is around festival right before the event but uh, monthly sales are generally okay what we do is uh, uh i think uh, about 12 hours or rather 24 hours before sale we kind of put a infra freeze sort of thing which is all the scaling that needs to be done and ec2 is kind of are on auto scaling so that doesn't kind of matter databases will have to be scaled once in a while it's just a function so maybe today it's working one month another mm-hmm. might have to scale up if for your utilization so all the infra scaling which needs to be done uh same for it is as well but uh, we'll have to wait 24 hours before the same for certain specific ec2 service services which are running on ec2 there we have stall them will have to be pre scaled because suddenly we see this pattern where um the right at 12 in the night uh you'll see your uh, traffic going into certain parts of the app which needs to be pre scaled right because to sudden spikes is cannot be handled so there we have built a system where people can get kind of put those values put it so it's a basically scheduled scaling scheduled scale ha so do a scheduled scaling up scaling scheduled down scaling as well after single little just go down so that works for your monthly sale because it's a simpler problem to have then we have this concept of war room which is uh people from each part parts uh basically one service owner one person per service yeah it could be one person managing multiple multiple services but basically someone in that war room who is just making sure everything is working as expected now this is a great opportunity for junior engineers to learn the learning happens when something breaks and we hope that things don't break but whenever a junior engineers are kind of monitoring it that is when they get to understand some of the nuances how does let's say traffic pattern correlate to your increase in cpu how does your increase in cpu in database changes your latency and so on yeah so it's a board uh, learning kind of watch it for junior engineer that is what we have done now which is mostly war rooms on monthly sale is run by uh, sd ones and twos yes so that is a great thing i think uh, two years back that was not the case there it used to be only lead engineers but now it has all shifted to junior engineers that helps in developing stronger ownership absolutely so that is there and then what we have is sale reflection which is every month after the sale we are going to get together every pod kind of presents what is happening in their own area head is more focused on what is working well what is not working well and there you do uncover scaling bottlenecks which you then put it back to your tech backlog which is tech led backlog and team kind of start fixing it so that is the story for monthly sale mega sale that we have like before season that is different there and this time uh and last time it was virtual war rooms because we he thought all have people yeah but for so i think couple of weeks before sale we kind of uh, started discussing together on kind of uh, service owners or lead engineers on what is the scale that we expect overall in terms of let's say dao users traffic app opens whatever how does that translate to your own individual traffic and based on that how much scaling needs to be done for a stateful layers which is that is uh, database and so on kafka etc uh, there is an interesting problem statement on the data engineering scaling which i'll come later but there is more back end serving load scaling yeah so people that of go back discuss there is a program management because we now have i don't know 30s of teams uh managing this so um yeah and then people come back and uh, this is scaled couple of hours before midnight we start running the war room 
and this war room kind of goes on for five days because it's a five day sale. Fortunately, this time I think it was very incident less. I would say like there's nothing happened. Like it was fairly straightforward apart from that hot charging issue and couple of other one minute or so sort of issues. Things were broadly fine and uh, it worked well. But uh, yeah, even this time we did not do buff testing for majority of the services and it worked well. Safety. And and uh, you were saying something about uh, the data engineering scale. Data engineering has been a very interesting journey for us. So we started with Redshift. Right. We started with database. At this stage we don't have Redshift. Right. Querying your DB. Ha, that is that works. No. Oh, and in Shuru Mein Toh. Only comes later. Correct. Shuru Mein Toh we don't have, we don't even have slaves. There's one master. And uh, there's this one guy from the business who needs data. Uh, for only this guy, why do you want to provision a slave? I just gave him access, gave him recommendation that he has it at night. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure you don't uh, run complex queries. Make sure you don't change it. Then uh, we didn't give him read, write access. If he drop the table, that will be a problem. So give him read only. Read access. Works, worked well for a couple of years. And then one day he made a mistake. This guy ran a complex query and the DB went down. This is protection. <laughs> Not a great situation to be, but this was 2018, late 2018. And for reference, like this was right after CDC. So I'm saying it's that late in the journey. Even then we don't have, like, uh, we have this kind of setup where people are directly accessing production data, which is okay. Like, that is the way to do it. It's working. Like, yeah. In parallel, we had started investing in Redshift. Uh, in fact, we used Hevo as well. Uh, Hevo data is one of the companies yeah. which provides pipelines and that was helpful in the beginning. So basically, it's more self serve for business. They can just, engineers can connect it and business can figure out. Richard worked for a couple of years. One year, I guess. Uh, in 2019, it started breaking at our scale, um, which was bad. And uh, since then, uh, data had been a struggle for us for at least a year. And we had to migrate out of Richard completely. And Misho is a strongly data-driven company. Most of the distance are backed by data. There are hundreds of analysts, business folks just looking at data for making decisions. So, then we moved to Data Lake, Presto, Spark, Hive, all sorts. And that set up and that is working well. For the last one year, we have reached a stage where um, even your standard managed services kind of start failing. For example, managed Kafka of AWS kind of just did not work. It should. Our scale is not, well, it's there, but you expect many services to work at this scale. There's just a lot of problems. So we moved to Confident for Kafka. This was for data platform as well as for the backend. Um, then uh, I think uh, Mixpanel, I think Mixpanel, we had Mixpanel is user then, analytics guy. That is integrated from day one. Right. Worked really well for first three, four years. Then it started breaking. So basically that is journey, which is you, in the beginning, use as much SaaS as possible to ever help you yeah. get up to speed and money. But every SaaS will break at some point. Yeah. And you was and then the I think for a tech leader, that is the challenging part, which is you have to anticipate when it is going to break before it breaks. And because migration will take time. And the expanded yeah. replacement will take time. We're not replacing Mixpanel. We have we have Mixpanel. But uh, uh so the data sports for Mixpanel did not work yeah. as expected. So we had to build our entire in-house pipeline for sending behavior elements from Android app directly to backend and combining it with mm-hmm. transaction and so on. So there I think uh, has been a very interesting journey there. We also introduced recently um, a reactive paradigm within data ingestion layer, which can then help us in scaling very quickly at a very cheaper cost. In fact, this year a big win for us was we reduced our server cost per order by half. Nice. And uh, without uh, degrading user experience. Right. There had been a, despite scale increasing, our cost has reduced per order by half, which has been a great achievement. If your team publishes some blogs or anything about it, it will be we lovely to read. Yes, then that's a good point. I think we have published a blog on that reactive paradigm for ingestion layer of data platform. Right. Which I think got surfaced in Amazon, etc. as well, where there are a lot of learnings on how do you ingest data in a very cost efficient manner. But overall cost reduction, we have it. And there's there are a lot of learnings which we'll definitely love to publish at some point. Right, 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 right. Towards the end, I would just uh, want to come uh, a little bit on the questions on the, the team and the people itself. Because uh, tech, I think, uh, great, great set of stories, I think lots of uh, learnings. Um, 
so the team, I think, a uh, couple of questions on them. One of them is, uh, like, right now, you have been speaking a lot about pods. So I believe, like, your team is uh, set up as pods. So was it like, I mean, it would not have been like this from day one, I guess, right? When I mean, you start off with very similar structure, layer wise structure. Bunch of people sitting, bunch of people table together, together, and then there's communication flow immediately. Yeah, and yeah. decision making. So, so, no, so sometimes, like, Teams I would see like you start off with three four people, then it's more this domain where like we are the Android guys, they are the backend guys like that, and then you end up with pods. So like, how has the journey been for you? And like, when did these inflections happen? No, I think that has been the journey, which is um, uh, it started with uh, same people being teams being organized as per expertise, and we did not have infra there for a long time, so <laughs> we had only backend, frontend, and Android. Yeah. Even IOS, we started late. Just for RTG, I think IOS penetration is pretty low. So, I think somewhere around uh, 2019, we started thinking about how do we organize people in pods. And that is where we kind of started dividing the entire marketplace, the entire value chain uh, into some cuts, which is demand supply. Within demand side, you'll have user growth. You'll have checkout, you'll have different parts. So basically some combination of dividing the entire business into different parts yeah. and the entire app into different parts. And then we kind of uh, created parts on the back end side. So right. that was first inflection point, which is we had a central Android team, central Android uh, front end team. Back end was divided into different parts. And each part had a product manager, design and so on. Right. But Android was centralized. And the reason for that is we did not have enough Android people in. Over time, hiring happens, right? There. So it's a trade-off, right? Pod is optimized for velocity. You don't need to do a lot of cross-pod prioritization. Yes. But there's inefficiency in terms of you need more people. That you did at least one Android person in that team, at least one backend person. And there might not be enough work for that person always. Oh, right. That is an inefficiency. So that's a trade-off. And at some point in time during the journey, you are okay with this trade-off. Because as team grows need for cross prioritization increase and that somewhere time it's just impossible you just cannot prioritize a supply side project with a demand side project both are the important critical pieces of the market so velocity and efficiency takes over the time in everything yep. <laughs> so yeah and then we ran this we realized yeah now we're in a stage where we can go full pot uh like 100 percent pot structure that is when we so around somewhere around 2020 around 2020, I guess, and 2020, where we divided the entire chain team into fully self-sufficient uh, cross-functional board structure. So Android front-end, back-end, uh, uh, design, product, everything kind of within that point. So yeah, I think that has been working fine. And apart from this, we, I think, as late as mid of last year, we had central data science team because data science team our data science journey started about a couple of years back. It seen a lot of benefits there, but uh, the team was pretty small. We had only about 10 to 15 data scientists until beginning of last year. Now we have about 50 data scientists, so it's a big team. So now we have applied the pod principle here as well. So <laughs> this is now split across different pods. But I think that is the rule of thumb. Like, until certain level, you just cannot split it into pods. Beyond certain level for a particular expertise, you're okay with splitting it because you can afford to. Right, right, right. Uh, and then I think. One last uh, question before we wrap up is like going ahead. Uh, like, uh, how do you see like like the growth of your uh, tech team in particular? Like, you know, what kind of areas do you intend to focus more on? What kind of uh, sort of uh, domains? I mean, I've been hearing about people investing a lot into AI and all. So, what kind of areas do you want to focus on? And then, what sort of people do you intend sort of add to the team in like the longer horizon? Sure. So yeah, I think. Uh... Overall, uh, the next couple of years, business-wise, there are two focus areas. One is profitability. Second is scale itself, which is you want to grow but to become profitable as well. The repercussions of that on the engineering side is you definitely need more engineers. So over the last two years consistently, or probably before that as well, we have every year doubled it. So, which was a big, very difficult thing to do. But we want to maintain their talent bar. We have a pretty decent talent bar. It's, uh, doing it is very hard. You need a lot of interviews. People have to spend a lot of 
time just interviewing people, but I think that is required because the scale at which we operate. And at a BAU level, we do more number of orders than Flipkart and Amazon individually. So at this scale, despite that, let's say we have about uh, 600 or engineering team. It's just Flipkart will have roughly 2,000 to something, potentially. Uh, not a comparison of, not a competition in terms of number of people, but I think at this complexity, you need a lot of engineers to kind of help you solve problems. For the next one year, uh, uh, the plan is to kind of invest more on the AI side. You said, right, I think over the last one year, we have increased data science team by about 4x at least. So, a lot more investments going into real-time personalization. So until now, we are more running in batch mode sort of personalization. So that is giving us a lot of results. Beyond that, on engineering side, scaling seems to be, continues to be an interesting problem statement. And you're right, we have set up platform teams, multiple platform teams across different docs. So I think a lot of interesting challenges around how do you scale databases, how do you make it more elastic, how do you quickly upgrade that tech stack of a database without needing a lot of program management, how do you do it in an automated manner, how do you recover from a failure very quickly? Because at our stage now, cost of failure has become very high. So every five minute of downtime will lead to a lot of business loss. So how do you solve that? In addition to solving all the problems that we need to solve for our users for the next phase of growth. Right, right, right. And then finally, any last words for, say, young engineers who are starting out their careers? I think uh, uh, probably like, Right now, a bit of the uh, employment market is a little challenging, but then I, I'd say more in general, like people who are starting out their careers in engineering and in tech and aspire to grow here. You have been, you know, work with places like Sony, but then also building like from scratch, uh, something like this in India. Uh, any, like I'd say, two, three lines sort of summarization in learnings for people? Sure. It's fantastic time to be in tech, specifically in India, because... I think this is a time when you see a lot of innovation happening. Yeah. And uh, you increasingly see the type of innovation which is happening. It's more solving India's specific problems, which will not get expensive. But particularly for junior engineers, applies to senior engineers as well. But for junior engineers, I think getting involved in a startup is the best way to learn because... At every stage of the of your career, you'll only grow when you get a lot of ownership. Ownership in line with your current level. Okay. There'll be more than that. Yes, yes. So only if you get a lot of ownership and exposure, you'll be able to learn. You just cannot get that level of exposure in big tech. They're just not organized to do that. So only in startups, obviously early stage, late stage, doesn't matter. You get to own so many complex problem sequence, so many services, so many parts of the app. That helps in learning. And second, I think peer learning works really well. So be very proactive and thoughtful about what type of startup you are joining to join because the second dimension of learning happens only through people around you. Make sure the right people, right expertise, where you can kind of get a lot of mentorship. And in the beginning, I think uh, having a good mentor helps a lot because there's so many things that can go wrong and obviously you'll iterate and make it right, but you'll have lost time. So finding a right mentor, and maybe mentor at next level, next to next level, who you really admire and aspire to become, would be a right choice. But uh, having a good mentor is also important. Right. right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev, you for uh, you know taking out your time. And, uh, you know, uh, it was a, a great conversation. Uh, that uh, having the cost on the order value, I will be looking forward if your team can write a blog on that. I think uh, people our viewers might also be interested in that. Um, but yeah, lovely conversation. Thanks again for taking out your time. Thank you. It was very interesting.